hopefully everything goes smoothly. At least you're keeping yourself well caffeinated in a coffee shop somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great, and uh, I also wanted to sort of virtually introduce you to Lorenzo, that is uh, um, also a co-host of uh, of this event. So, in case I drop, um, I don't know how to, <laughs> maybe they kick me out here. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so um, he's going to sort of take over the the moderation and so on. Um, Lorenzo, you're, you're online, right? I, yeah, yeah, I'm online. Okay, I'm here. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Hi, Sarah. Lovely to meet you. Yeah. Nice. Likewise. Likewise. Perfect. Um, right. Okay. And uh, then. Okay. I think maybe we, we can get a start. Just going to uh, start the recording just in case. Awesome. And all right. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for being here. And thank you, Sarah, for, for taking the time um, to, to give a seminar today. Um, I don't really think that Sarah needs uh, an introduction, so I'm, but I'm going to do the customary one, uh, keep it short. <laughs> uh, so uh, Sarah is a, is a research scientist at Google Brain, uh, works on a number of uh, really interesting aspects of um, uh, machine learning research from interpretability, fairness, robustness. She's also um, found, the founder of a local Bay Area, Bay Area nonprofit called Delta Analytics, uh, one of the co-founders of Trustworthy, the Trustworthy ML Initiative on the advisory board of patterns. Um, so we're really, really uh, uh, excited to, to have her uh, uh, here today virtually. Um, and uh, she's going to talk about um, the myth of, of the interpretable, robust, compact, compact and high performance deep neural network. Uh, so without further ado, thanks, Sarah. Take it away. <laughs> thanks, Emiliano. I'm glad uh, you were able to get through the fairly long title of today's talk. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. So um, I'm excited to share some of the ideas that I've been thinking about and I'm hoping um, you are all excited to engage with. So what I'll talk about today is firstly, uh, why we care about thinking about multiple objectives. So what motivates a lot of my work. Um, and then I'll talk uh, about a lot of my recent work, which is understanding the trade-offs between different desirable objectives. Um, so feel free, I, I have, um, I'll probably do kind of intersperse opportunities for questions. So feel free to add questions to the chat and then I can take them when there's a pause. Um, but to begin with, uh, I wanna talk about imperfect objectives. So what motivates us to care about codifying some of these preferences um, and, and what is imperfect about our current training objectives? Uh, and to, to start, um, a good motivator is a very famous horse called Cleverhands, who was in Berlin um, between 1891 and 1907, would regularly entertain the crowds. And hence the horse was famous because uh, the, the horse presented a remarkable ability to compute arithmetic functions, to identify colors, to accurately count the crowd. Uh, this, of course, uh, launched a, a formal scientific committee to understand how Clever Hands was able to do this. Um, and it, it turned out that what was required was an experimental design. So um, Clever Hands could, would not be able to answer the question correctly if the human did not know the answer. This revealed that the horse was in fact answering correctly by picking up on microscopic facial cues. This is what I call an example of high accuracy without true learning. And in many ways, a lot of the model functions that we prefer today and that we use in machine learning, uh, such as deep neural networks, uh, also lead to these clever hands moments. So because we delegated learning of the function to the model, um, we often see high accuracy without true learning. For example, uh, here we have two pictures of a cow and two pictures of a limo. Uh, in the pictures of the cow, which do you think the model predicts incorrectly? The right or the left? <laughs> 
feel, for those of us uh, on the Zoom, feel free to add your guests to the chat. So Atif says right. Atif is in fact correct. Um, and for the limo, what do we think? The left or the right in terms of what the model predicts incorrectly? Left. Okay, interesting. Emiliana says left. Uh, AC says left. So uh, with the limo, it's in fact the right. Perhaps what is being picked up in this example is where the model has uh, has trained on the majority of examples. So uh, for example, in the cow set, uh, this model predicts the cow on the beach incorrectly because the majority of training examples were cows on these type of luscious green landscapes. Um, and in fact, the model learned to associate the background. With the limo, it's actually more rare in this particular training set for limos on ice. Uh, so the right is the one the model predicts incorrectly. This may feel familiar to you as this idea that when we train deep neural networks, often the network leverages these spurious correlations. So here, uh, a human would be robust to this change in background, but the model has learned to rely as much on the background as it has the object. Um, and this poses, uh, tricky problems with generalization. So when do we adapt to a new background? We still would like our models to perform well on the objects. Uh, there's other really fun examples of this. So this was a publicly released API um, that captioned images. And here we see it captions sheep uh, for this, again, like luscious backdrop um, of hills and perhaps this pastoral element is where sheep are normally uh, seen. Uh, and then we also see here a uh, captioned dog, uh, these children holding sheep, uh, perhaps because a frequent training image or the training images that do exist of children holding an animal are typically a dog. And this is perhaps uh, humorous, interesting, but it can have, um, and we also see it, but by the way, with language. So we often see overfitting to pattern matching. We see behavior which is um, un undesirable memorization that leads to leakage of private text. And we see that models can factually generate uh, incorrect statements. Uh, but when this happens, you know, this can be seen as curious or even from an academic perspective interesting. But when it happens in sensitive domains, there can be a huge cost to human welfare. So, for example, uh, studies on healthcare data show that with skin lesion data sets, often the model overfits to the presence of a ruler, which is in the training set photographed uh, alongside a certain type of malignant tumor. tumor. And uh, for pneumonia training sets, uh, it's been shown that uh, the model is leveraging the presence of metal tags, which were used by one hospital in particular that had a different rate of incidence um, of diagnosis. And so these are, of course, not generalizable aspects. We won't have a ruler when we uh, try and deploy a model in the real world. Uh, and not all hospitals will place metal tags on their patients. Um, the question then becomes how to audit this type of behavior and how to understand when generalization is behaving um, in a way which is undesirable. Uh, top line metrics often hide this type of critical model behavior. So in deployment settings, it's often necessary to go beyond top line metrics to ensure desirable behavior. This might involve questions like how does my model perform, but also questions around how might my model perform. And uh, a key reason this is challenging is that our typical loss functions impose no preference for functions that are interpretable, fair, robust, or guarantee privacy. So we must, in fact, modify them, so design additional constraints, um, uh, or do acrobatics after trading, which is often the case for some of these subfields where, for example, interpretability, we train a model that minimizes cross-entropy and then we almost act surprised at the end that it's not interpretable and do all these acrobatics afterwards to try and interpret the model. Um, and this in itself is a challenge. 
Uh, I like this quote by Donald Newth that said, computers do exactly what they are told, no more and no less. Uh, and what this is saying is that a model can fulfill an objective in many ways while violating the spirit of said objective. And uh, today, I think a key theme of what I'll be talking about is that in complex systems, it's very difficult to model all variables or foresee implications. Uh, we see that, for example, with anti-drug campaigns in the early 2000s, where advertisements for uh, against the use of marijuana actually encourage the use of marijuana. We see that with actions in the Great Plague, where ordering the, the killing of dogs and cats actually exacerbated the presence of rats that were carrying the disease. So often when we optimize for one thing, it can have unforeseen complications for other properties that we may care about. And this is of key interest to my research agenda because uh, I think that uh, to date, it's often been opaque the interaction between the model design choices we make and all of these desirable properties that we may want a model to fulfill. Uh, that arguably is largely because uh, the subfields have developed to some extent in isolation. Um, so we often talk about these properties with reference to top line metrics, but not with reference to each other. And this is a natural symptom of these fields are emerging and developing, um, but it misses the opportunity to gain an understanding of how uh, all these properties may share um, uh, common threads and interesting research intersections. So today I really want to uh, center this talk around a case study. So uh, a lot of my recent work has been thinking about how does model compression trade off against other properties? Uh, and to start with, um, let me introduce some of the context about um, perhaps why this is interesting. Um, so I'll talk about a few things. I want to talk about the intriguing relationship between weights and generalization. Uh, and then I want to talk about why are some parts of the data distribution far more sensitive. Uh, this is part of a wider question that I'm currently thinking about. And so I'll, I'll end by sharing some of the, the research questions that uh, I, I, I think are really relevant to our community right now, which is when is memorization good versus bad? And how do we impose constraints on capacity that can adapt to our, um, our desired generalization property? Um, so uh, my recent work, as I mentioned, has focused on designing these deep neural networks that are compact, reliable, and trustworthy. And to understand why it's such an interesting problem to work on, we need to understand how we got here. So in our field, performance of a model has often been treated as synonymous with the pursuit of top line metrics. And often what this is uh, incentivized is a formula of bigger is better. <laughs> So we see this in many subfields, but there's been a race in the number of model parameters. Um, and this is largely because we've seen there are returns in terms of top line metrics when we add a lot of parameters to our models. Uh, this is specific, is not specific to, to a given subfield. And in fact, uh, NLP has recently dominated in terms of larger and larger models. Um, and there are arguments in favor of this approach. So it, it has become clear that different regimes of capacity uh, in terms of the number of parameters appear to allow for different generalization properties. So we see different properties emerge at different sizes of models. Uh, and I also suspect it's very popular because it's a simple formula. So throw more parameters at the model. Uh, however, it, there's a key limitation of this approach. So the relationship between weights and generalization properties uh, is not well understood. Uh, and to, to articulate why it's not well understood, um, it, it's important to ask the question, why do we need so many weights in the first place? And here, there's a lack of consensus. So it's very clear, for example, that there's diminishing returns to adding parameters. Millions of parameters are needed to eke out additional gains. So we can even see this going back to inception v3 and inception v4. We double the amount of weights from 21 million to 41 million, but we only eke out two percentage points more in accuracy. 
There's also enormous redundancy between weights. So it's been found that you can use a small amount of weights to predict 95% of weights in the network. Um, and uh, what we also see is that most of these weights can be removed after training is finished, uh, while only losing a few percentage points in accuracy. Uh, so for example, this is work I did with my colleagues and we benchmarked many different com compression techniques, specifically sparsity techniques. And what we show is that even when 90% of the weights removed on a task like ImageNet, ResNet 50, you only lose 3% of performance. Uh, and even if you remove at random, which is kind of the, the most crude approach to this, uh, you still don't lose substantial capacity. So random pruning is actually the yellow. Um, and what the, this prompts is that understanding how capacity impacts generalization is an increasingly urgent question for two reasons. So we are now in an era of bigger, bigger models. So it's important to ask how do generalization properties change in terms of fairness, robustness, privacy. But we're also, because we're in an era of bigger, bigger models, often making design choices at deployment time that alter these generalization properties. So we're applying compression techniques just before we deploy, such as pruning, quantization, fine tuning to a downstream task. Um, and often these, this, these uh, last minute design choices are treated as last minute, but are not audited in the same way that the initial model is. And this is interesting also uh, in terms of understanding this relationship between generalization and capacity is also interesting for theoretical reasons. So can we do better than deep neural network? Because at face value, it appears to be a very inefficient representation. So the need for so many extra parameters to eke out a few percentage points in accuracy suggests there are inefficiencies. Um, it also, our ability to remove most of the weights after training is also uh, prompts the question of why can't we remove it at the beginning of training? So what about uh, the properties of uh, this the representation space requires us to first have all the weights and then gradually remove weights? Um, and I did recent work on this uh, w with uh, first author Caleb, which is really trying to understand properties like what is the gradient flow that allows for convergence when you have um, starting sparse versus having a lot of capacity at the beginning and then gradually removing capacity. It's really interesting for those of you that are interested in that direction. Um, uh, but today uh, I'll be talking more about Given that we've sparsified, uh, what is the impact? Uh, I'll raise a third motivator from my perspective, which is that it's very clear that our current trajectory is, is not quite sustainable. Uh, and it's one of those reasons is that as a point of comparison, our brain is incredibly energy efficient. <laughs> So we have 85 billion neurons, but we run on the energy equivalent of an electric shaver. And part of this reason is that we have very, very, uh, very clear design choices embedded that allow for much more efficient treatment. So we have log scale vision, so we ignore a lot of information that isn't a noticeable uh, change. We have specialized pathways for certain inputs. Uh, we also don't treat all examples equally, which we do with deep neural networks. So it's of interest to me to understand how we're using capacity because it also motivates rethinking capacity from various different perspectives. Uh, and of course, there are the practical reasons. So most of the world is using ML in a resource constrained environment. And so understanding better why we need so many weights uh, informs how we get better uh, at actually making ML accessible. Um, and in particular, the compression techniques that I will talk about are widely used because of uh, two main issues that come into play when you deploy. So firstly, uh, storing uh, these networks, particularly when you get to a certain size, demands a lot of memory because the weights themselves have to be stored. Uh, but also, uh, the bigger the network, the higher the latency. So the, the, the techniques I'll talk about, quantization and sparsity, are often used to try and reduce these objectives. Uh, so the question that I want to think about today is how can we have these networks with radically different structures and number of parameters with comparable performance? Uh, 
So how can we remove half the weights on ImageNet ResNet 50 and go from 76 to 76 so we lose less than a percentage point of accuracy? And one possibility is that top line metrics are not a precise enough measure to capture how capacity impacts the generalization properties of the model. So to gain intuition, we go beyond. I'll be talking in particular about two papers that I worked on on this topic. Um, and here in the, this work, we ask, how does the model behavior diverge as we vary the level of compression? So in particular, we look at the robustness to certain types of distribution shift, but we also measure divergence in class level and exemplar level performance. And uh, sparsity is a very useful mechanism to understand the role of capacity. So for a few reasons, one is that we can precisely vary the level of sparsity. So it's a very nice experimental setup because we can essentially take the same structure um, and vary the fraction of total weights that are active at inference time. And for those of you who may be less familiar, um, what sparsifying networks looks like is that you have an estimate of what weights are unimportant. And uh, by the time that you've reached the end of training, you have set the subset of weights to zero. Um, and today in particular, we'll be talking about sparsifying during training where you iteratively introduce sparsity. Um, there's also different techniques. So train and sparsify. So you do one shot sparsity at the end um, and sparse training. So train and sparsify and sparse training are still not competitive with sparsifying during training. So. Um, this is the most, uh, it's the technique which gets us closest to the performance of a dense model, the original dense model. And when I say sparsity of 90%, what I'm going to, what I'm going to mean is that by the end of training, the model only has 10% of all weights remaining. So a mere fraction of what we had at the beginning. Uh, and we'll look at a range. So we're going to precisely vary it, and we're going to go from 0%, which is the entirely dense model, to 99%, where you you only have 1% of weights active at the end of training. And uh, this is of particular interest because what we know from various different settings is that sparse models easily outcompete dense models with similar parameter count. So we see this in vision, we see this in NLP. Um, and what it means that when we take sparse models, we're actually comparing in a similar uh, performance regime in terms of top line metrics to the top line mo to the unsparsified models, despite having very different uh, parameter counts. And this is important because we avoid the issue of comparing a bad model to a good model. We're really comparing models which are seen uh, as in a similar bucket of performance, but with very different structures. So it becomes a very interesting question. So to give you the key results up front uh, and to uh, save any uh, mystery, uh, what we do find is that these top level metrics High critical differences. So in particular, sparse models amplify sensitivity to adversarial examples and common corruptions. Um, we also find that varying sparsity disproportionately impacts part of the distribution. And that's where I'll spend uh, a, a little bit of time today talking about why, what makes parts of the distribution more sensitive. And uh, to, to give a little bit more context about uh, the results on corruptions, what we did was we looked at two uh, academic benchmarks, ImageNet C and ImageNet A. ImageNet C is the what you see here. So it injects different corruptions into the input image. And what you're, what you're measuring is when you introduce these corruptions, what, how does the performance of the model change? So what we plot is actually the relative performance to the non-prune model. So what you see is that as you increase the sparsity on the x-axis, you're amplifying the sensitivity to corruptions. Um, and in particular to types of noise. So we found that Gaussian noise, shot noise, impulse noise were by far um, the, the model, the sparse model was by far the most sensitive to. Uh, we also looked at ImageNet A. So ImageNet A is a curated uh, set of natural adversarial examples, which means that it's been curated based on its ability to be classified incorrectly uh, across a, I believe it was a ResNet 50. And so what we look at, again, on the x-axis, you have the model sparsity, and then you're looking at the relative top one accuracy. So this is relative to the non-compressed, and you can see that the sensitivity increases as you increase the sparsity. Um, 
this brings us to the question of how does model compression impact parts of the distribution? So we find that compression disproportionately cannibalizes on a small subset of classes to preserve and sometimes even improve relative performance on others. So this loss and generalization is far more concentrated than the relative gains, and a few classes bear the brunt of the degradation caused by weight removal. Uh, also, this is more pronounced the more they use sparsify. Uh, so what does this uh, disproportionately impact of part of the distribution look like? We call this pruning identified exemplars. So these are images where the predictive behavior diverges between a population of independently trained compressed and non-compressed models. Um, so here's a question for all of you. What is the true label for this image? Be brave, throw it out there. What do we think that the true label on this image is? So Chief says stage, okay. Uh, Sylvia says table, so not quite, both are good. This is actually a toilet seat. Khalid says surface of chair. Um, so this is, so that's actually fairly close. Interesting, yeah. Uh, it's actually a toilet seat, the true label. So this is an example of non-pi from the same class. Um, how about this one? What do we think the true label is? So Hidi says espresso, Mehmet says some kind of dessert. Hidi is correct. This is the first time someone has gotten this. Excellent, bravo. Uh, so this is an example of an espresso from the pie class versus non-pie. Um, what about this one? What's the true label here? it says maize. Yes, this is in fact a maze. Ruri says Sudoku. So this is in fact a, this is a very uh, high classification rate, I have to say. <laughs> I'm very impressed. Uh, so here we see this example of pi for maize versus a non-pi. Um, and here, this is actually wool for pi versus non-pi. And this is actually matchstick. So perhaps what you gathered from that exercise uh, and we had some very excellent, uh, accurate guesses. Uh, but it, it, you may have gathered that these are also just more challenging images for algorithms and for humans to classify. Um, and we see that. So we see that when we use a non-compressed model, so we're using a non-compressed model on these ex examples that have been identified, uh, restricting inference to pi drastically reduces model performance. We also find that what we are seeing is that pi is over indexing on underrepresented attributes. So when we plot features which are represented in the data, we show that the relative representation of pi uh, is far higher if the feature is uh, underrepresented. And what this is really saying is that we lose the long tail when we remove the majority of all training weights. But this can actually be put differently, and I think it's quite powerful when we put it differently, which is that we are actually using the majority of our weights to encode a useful representation for a small fraction of our training distribution. Um, and these are low frequency events. So we're using the weights to memorize very rare examples in the data set. And when we remove these weights, the model lose performance on these rare examples. And uh, we conducted a, a human study where we were seeking to characterize exactly what was lost. So we took all these pi examples and we had them classified um, by humans again. And what we found was that uh, really where pi is over indexed relative to non pies is in two different categories. So one is noisy data points. So here the data is improperly structured. It may be mislabeled, severely corrupted or multi-object. Um, and here's some examples of noisy pies. So uh, for example, uh, some of these are incorrectly structured because ImageNet is a single image classification task. But for many of these categories, two labels present in the data set would be sufficient. 
So for example, in this first image, we see the true label is parallel bars. Um, the non-prune label is parallel bars and the prune is horizontal bars. And you can in fact see that in this image, there are both parallel bars as well as horizontal bars. So it's reasonable that both labels would be appropriate. This is my personal, I mean, there's a few ImageNet categories that I find personally um, amusing. <laughs> I guess that's an appropriate word. But in ImageNet, there's both a label for corn and for ear of corn. The same way there's a label for screen and monitor. Um, and the, it, 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 there's actually a, a subset of these examples. There's crib and there's another word which is a more fancy way of saying crib. I'll have to think of it by the end of the talk. But um, these are essentially collapsed classes. These are classes which overlap in meaning. And in fact, if you look at how they've been curated at ImageNet, they are one and the same many times. And so here it really is a 50-50 uh, guess because they're often featured visually together. Another example of this is groom versus uh, and suit. Cradle, that may be it. Thank you, Mohammed. But yeah, that could be it. Uh, or is it, hmm. Let me, I'll bring it up at the end when we do questions. I'll take it as an opportunity. I'll look it up. I actually collected these examples for a while because I found it so baffling that so many existed. There's also uh, sunglass and sunglasses, and they, they, they exist as separate classes, which is kind of fascinating. Um, another example of noisy pies is corrupted or uh, incorrectly labeled data. So this may fit our definition that we more typically assume as uh, artifacts in the data generation process. Um, and here it can be that there's just not sufficient information to arrive at the classification. So for example, here's an a, uh, image which the true label is restaurant, but there's no way to infer that this plate is at a restaurant. Um, in the second image is envelope, but it's far too small for you know that to be seen as the object of interest. Um, and here, there's things like tub, uh, but in fact, it, it, it's there's, uh, it's very difficult to infer that it is a tub. Um, and the second category that I'll talk about, and I think before I talk about the second category, it's it's useful to think about, well, is this a good use of capacity to learn these examples? Arguably, it's a misuse of parameters to represent these data points because, uh, in fact, they're just not properly structured for the task. We have a single image classification task, and many of these examples are not structured in the data processing and how the task has been formulated um, to generalize. So this is what I would deem bad memorization. The second group is uh, atypical data points or challenging exemplars. So from our human study, we saw that PI is heavily over-indexed on underrepresented vantage points and more challenging data points. So here's some examples. We, we see things like unusual objects that are pictured perhaps outside of where they would typically be seen. Um, and this is arguably a valuable use of parameter points to represent. This is something that I would call good memorization. Uh, these results lead to the natural subsequent question of, well, how does this have implications for things like algorithmic bias? Um, so, particularly when we have a protected attribute that's part of a low frequency subgroup, um, we may see a tension between something like compression and a fairness objective that uh, asks for representation, uh, avoiding representation disparities, so different error rates on different uh, groups. Uh, and we do, in fact, find that sparsity disproportionately impacts these underrepresented protective features and amplifies this notion of algorithmic bias. Um, and we see that across tasks. So we look at both Celeb A, uh, where the protected attribute is uh, that is most underrepresented is uh, blonde men. And then we also see it in civil comments. So this is the task of detecting toxic comments. And here the target label is very rare. So it's only 8% of the training set. And we again find that sparsity sharply degrades the model ability to detect toxic comments and most impacted groups are least represented in the train set. I want to say a wider perspective after doing uh, this thread of research is that whether this is 
considered aging or impeding performance depends on how relevant learning the rare artifacts are for the task and the objective. And in fact, I'll bring as an example a work that I did where the first author was Areva. Um, and we were looking at the impact of pruning in low resource machine translation. And here you have a double low resource bind. So you have a limited data regime and you have compute resource constraints. Um, and what we find is that in distribution in the low data regime, we find very similar results to what we observed in the computer vision setting. So it disproportionately impacts performance on the long tail. Um, and we, we look at this by observing the differences between the performance on a frequently uh, frequent phrases uh, test set versus a random test set. So this captures, we see much more spread when we look at just a random uh, selection. Um, and we also see differences in the ability to translate phrases of different lengths. So sparse models do worse at that. But what we find is when we look at out of distribution data sets, high levels of sparsity consistently improve generalization. And it's worth pausing and thinking, how are these results reconcilable? And this largely has to do with uh, a wider question. So when do we want to curb memorization of rare features? And uh, in particular, for low resource translation and for the languages that we were considering, which were African languages, uh, often researchers are using this JW300. JW300 is actually a very specialized religious corpus. It exists because uh, religious entities translated their texts into many different languages. Um, and that's why it's a good basis for machine translation. Uh, but for this case, in part, why we were seeing this improved performance on our distribution because of sparsity is because the rare artifacts in this type of text uh, are very specialized. So they're even rare in other settings that we want to generalize to. And this is interesting and important to think about. And it leads to the almost various insights about when memorization fades and hurts. So in the in-distribution considerations, it really depends what's the composition of your data points. I think this is another limitation in machine learning. We often talk a lot about data points we're uncertain about, but not about the source of uncertainty. And the source of uncertainty is very important because it really dictates whether the downstream remedy, whether you want to improve the, the, the model's ability to learn these data points or whether you want to do additional data cleaning or remove the data points entirely. Um, but out of distribution considerations, it depends how far the data set you want to generalize to is away from your training distribution. Um, the commonality between all these settings is that memorization is currently very expensive. So we are using the majority of our weights to memorize very rare examples. And this has far ranging implications because most of our data sets follow a ZIF distribution. So if we do want to model the world, we need to design and train models that can efficiently navigate these low frequency events. Uh, adding parameters has become a very popular recipe in our community, but if we're using the majority of these parameters to represent the long tail, it is a problem that's more cheaply solved elsewhere. Um, and this is perhaps my grumpy opinion of the day. <laughs> uh, I know there's a lot of enthusiasm right now for uh, scaling laws and for essentially um, continuing to follow this recipe. But uh, I think that what a lot of the insights from uh, understanding how this capacity is used is that we may be on an unsustainable path. And we, we may need to focus more on how do we change the shape of the curve rather than just persisting uh, it along the curve. Um, some parting thoughts, uh, and I guess not really parting because I, I'm really happy to see we have plenty of time for discussion and questions and I'd love to get your thoughts. Um, what motivated a lot of this work is this, like, this realization that how we model the interactions between properties um, is fairly opaque. Uh, a lot of this is how we've structured uh, the, the contributions within science. So we, we tend to have uh, fairly specialized subfields. That's why I was delighted to attend a forum like this today, where I think uh, a lot of the goal is inviting uh, researchers across subfields and not just security, but privacy, but also perhaps 
uh, wider still to, to discuss and to think about these problems, because we often treat these problems uh, as siloed uh, and only in relation to offline metrics. But um, I'm saying the trade-offs between objectives can unlock new insights and prompt new directions of research. For example, one thing I've been thinking about recently is that we see very uh, similar mechanisms uh, in, in terms of design choices which impede fairness um, between compression and privacy. So things like gradient clipping and noise injection can also disproportionately impact underrepresented attributes. Um, what's interesting about this is that these are essentially different me mechanisms for curbing propensity for memorization, and it's, uh, it raises the question of how do these all interact, and uh, can we be more precise about the mechanism itself. Um, so things like this, I think, could really benefit from a uh, cross subfield treatment, um, and it's one of the reasons I was really excited to present here today. Uh, that being said, I'd love to open up for questions or discussion, thoughts, um, et cetera. So let me do that now. Thank you, Sarah. So, you know, being out of applause and, you know, a bit virtual and, you know, you have to just uh, settle for the single clap here, but just imagine yeah. that everyone is really applauding here. Um, it, was a, it was a truly um, fascinating talk that help us really to navigate a journey, not just, you know, one result. Um, and this is what I find uh, fairly fascinating. Um, I have questions, but I would like to see first, you know, I want to give the, the words to others. So let me just go very quickly. So first, I, I'm going to be stopping